Hey guys, Jim Cox, and I'm here with an interview with Zach Ellsworth. Um, we'd actually connected on Facebook, and he has a background uh, that I found interesting in um, leftist philosophy and economy. And so wanted to talk to him to kind of learn more about the subject and kind of discuss where we're at today. So Zach, thanks for taking the time to uh, chat today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about your background. How did you become in, interested or involved in kind of learning more about um, the political left? Well, uh, for me, it's been kind of a, a zigzag, so to speak. Uh, the, the first driving passion of my life was uh, urban planning. I've always just been kind of fascinated with cities and how they operate and, and all that sort of thing. So I went to school, got my undergraduate and then my, my uh, master's in urban planning. Um, through there, I learned about the, the uh, sub-philosophy of new urbanism, which is things like, um, it's basically just community, good community design. So things like walkability, being able to uh, access your job, your, your um, places for entertainment, all, all the, the destinations of your daily life uh, within walking distance or, or a short bike ride or whatever. Uh, things like mixed use, uh, doing not just residential buildings, but incorporating in commercial and, and other stuff like that, um, as well as things like meaningful architecture, real sense of place. Um, and having thing, everything be very interconnected and, and robust in terms of like mass transit. So you can take your bike to the, the light rail and take uh, the light rail to uh, your destination, stuff like that. Um, and so that, that was really my, my first passion. Uh, and then as I was getting out of my undergraduate degree, I got into uh, natural landscaping, which eventually led me to uh, permaculture, which is my 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 second big passion. I got really interested in, in that. And permaculture, just in, in brief, is uh, basically a design system where you can take anything and make it more sustainable, more robust, more resilient to, to shocks. Um, and it, it consists of three ethics, those being earth care, people care, and then the third ethic, which is uh, somewhat controversial in the movement, but, but basically it boils down to uh, what's called fair share. So the idea of returning uh, the surplus of whatever you produce to the, the um, service of the first two ethics. Sure. Uh, and it also has, has to do with the, uh, David Holmgren, one of the originators, laid out uh, 12 principles of permaculture. And they're things like uh, observe and interact, uh, obtain yield, design from the patterns to the details and stuff like that. And so I saw a lot of uh, a parallels between uh, both new urbanism and permaculture. And I thought, you know, what if we what if we put those two ideas together and saw what we come up with? And uh, in fact, there, there had been a movement to do just that, uh, mm -hmm. which was the transition towns movement, the idea that um, we're all facing these these big uh, existential threats of, of things like climate change and at the time peak oil, although that's kind of uh, gone by the wayside in, in recent years. Not many people talk about that anymore. Uh, but their idea was to re reimagine society in a way that uh, we can meet all our needs without compromising the needs of future generations to do the same. Um, and so I, get I got uh, into that movement. Uh, started an organization in the, the Twin Cities where I live, and uh, I, I had a good time connecting with other people that were thinking about the same sort of things that I was, but I always kind of felt there was something lacking. Uh, I would go to these meetings, and it was all people who, who had houses, who were financially secure, um, who had the time and the extra the money to really play with these ideas, and so it, it seems like it wasn't quite accessible to everyone. And so uh, I kind of uh, cast it about for a while for, for something that would make my, my first two uh, passions make more sense. And uh, then uh, the, uh, the housing bubble burst in, in 08. And uh, following that, the Occupy Wall Street uh, protest got going. And that really elevated my consciousness a whole lot 
before that point, I hadn't really thought too much about any sort of leftist theory. Um, through like high school, we would read books like uh, uh, 1984 and Animal Farm and stuff like that. And the interpretations that I would get through professors and through classmates was that things like communism and socialism and all that stuff, they may sound nice on paper, but when it comes down to it, 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 just leads to more totalitarianism. So I, I'd, I had kind of put that aside in the back of my mind for a long time, but then Occupy came and kind of reawakened a lot of that stuff, those those ideas that, hey, maybe there is something different than uh, the current system that we live in, what, what I had been used to my entire life. Um, and so then after uh, a while, I got into podcasting. Um, I didn't. I wasn't producing podcasts myself yet, but I, I just got really interested in podcasts, and just through kind of the the meanderings of of you know, this show being recommended and that show being recommended, and, and just my interests changing, I got to uh, some actual leftist content, and they were talking about ideas like uh, the labor theory of value, and. Um, Season, uh, workers owning the means of production and stuff like that that I didn't really have much contact with before that point. And so all of this kind of just kept, um, I don't know, I'd say like uh, building in the back of my mind. And then uh, the Bernie Sanders candidacy also really catapulted a lot of these ideas to the, the, fore of my, the forefront of my mind as well. Um. And I just kept learning and, and finding new creators and, and new ideas to pursue. And, and finally, I got to the point where I was exposed to uh, these actual leftist theories of, of not just Karl Marx, but people like Peter Kropotkin and um, some of the other older communists and, and anarchists. And just from there, I just kept going, uh, uh, found... Um, other people that were in, that were sharing my interests, found other creators that were talking about the, the kinds of things that that I found really interesting, and it just kind of gone from there. So when I finally arrived at, at all these leftist ideas, it really started making uh, things like permaculture and, and new urbanism make a whole lot more sense uh, when you when you have that kind of horizontal organization structure where everyone has a say you're injecting more democracy into whatever system that you're creating then instead of uh things like transition towns where you tend to get the the well-to-do you get uh kind of more of a more of a slice of life you get things that are good for everybody um and so i've been just kind of trying to synthesize all these three ideas together into uh uh, something new, so a, a new guiding force, um, and I've, I've uh, when you, when you have a new philosophy, uh, you kind of need a new name for it. So the the name that I came up with is uh, the theory of Solaris. So Solaris is a Latin word; it means of the sun, and I believe that uh, it it makes a good metaphor for what I think is at the bottom of of all these three um, philosophies. Uh, whether it's new urbanism, permaculture, or any sort of leftist theory, when it comes down to it, it's all about building connection and building interconnection and, and sharing rather than, than, than taking. So, um, so I feel that the, the sun, the thing that connects us all, I mean, liter- literally and figuratively, the thing that, that makes all the food grows that we either eat ourselves or, or we feed to the, the food that we later eat, um, all the energy that, that has allowed us to shape our modern world comes in the form of either fossilized solar energy or more direct or indirect solar energy in, in wind or solar power. Um, pretty much every sort of energy on Earth aside from nuclear is, is directly from the sun. So I feel it's a good, it's a good metaphor for uh, interconnectedness. And so that's kind of how I arrived at that and uh, just kind of gone from there. That's awesome. So I, uh, you know, I, I usually don't take notes, but I found that I've already taken a, <laughs> a ton of uh, notes in order to try to keep track of like, it's a lot so of many, I'm throwing out so there. many, so <laughs> many things to like drill down into. And, sure. um, 
So one of the things that you, you mentioned is um, transition towns. So how mm. old is this concept of transition town that it's been around? Like, uh, is this something new or is this something from like the 80s or 90s? I'm like, how far does this go back? It's, it's relatively new. Um, the guy who started it, I believe, is only in maybe his mid-40s. Um, let, me, let me just... I can look it up real quick, in fact. But I, I think it came about some around, like, uh, the early aughts or, or maybe even the, the teens. Okay. Um, and so. it's, is there cases where, like, transition... So what's the definition of a transition town? Is it one that that is based on sustainability, or is it some something... Is it an end result in itself, or is it something to yeah. push society towards yet another level i think it's 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 both a destination and kind of a, a process as well um just looking it up it, it looks like it started only in 2005 in england um okay and they actually have a framework you can you can follow their their steps to becoming an official transition town of the movement um so oh, i'm sorry i don't know where i was going with that but but yeah basically it's uh it's a, just a process of, of connecting with neighbors and then using your, your democratic power to thing, do things like shape ordinances. Um, it could be anything as simple as like, you know, you have an ordinance in your town against owning chickens. Will you go ahead and you get enough people together and, and change that and mm-hmm. put in more uh, sensible ordinances that, that balance everybody's needs? Um, it could be something like uh, just changing the, it could be something as big as changing the land use code to allow things like mixed use buildings so that people don't have to rely on uh, cars as much and so that things can be a little more compact. Um, so yeah, it, it's things like that. So really it goes towards better efficiency, more participation, mm-hmm. and you know that gets back to, uh, again, you're connecting to leftist theory now like you said like a lot of there's a lot of criticism of left leftist thinking that oh there's the communists and socialists they'll Mm -hmm. take over and you know uh, destroy freedom and leads to totalitarianism like you said in reality um you know i just don't see that as the case i mean i think if you look at the cases of you know where um where people point to, those were in fact authoritarian authoritarian regimes to begin with, you know, right. and they were either communist or socialist in name only, and not really an example of, like you described, democratic, real democratic sure. principles, you know. So, I mean, that mislabeling has been something that you know, um, the political system has been using to pillory the left for over a hundred years, oh, you know? Absolutely. So how do you get to a point where this just, just doesn't become a, a name calling match, which <laughs> where labels really, the labels don't even have any value. You know, it, they're really just triggers to close off any discussion of yep. any real value. Yep, they're basically just a way to, to shut down discussion and declare yourself the victor without having to make any points or anything. Um, or even or even to defend yourself. I right, mean, it yeah. Leaves, just, oh, commie, that's, that's it, yep. <laughs> yeah, capitalism means freedom. Well, I, you know, I think if you look at the economy these days, you know, there's right. several million people that would... Uh, you know, argue that point. Right. Absolutely. Um, so I think one of the factors that kind of, uh, kind of combats that sort of a, a mentality is, is just time. It's been uh, decades and decades since the, the McCarthy era and the Red Scare where terms like that were enough to get people thrown in jail um, or to get protests shut down or, or whatever. So people in my generation, I, can, I consider myself an elder millennial, um, but people in my generation and, and the generations coming up haven't grown up under uh, 
a time when communism has been, you know, even much of a reality around the world. I mean, you still have China left as a major world power, but the USSR fell in the 90s, which is before a lot of, uh, like, before all of the Zoomers were born. Uh Um, And before a lot of my generation was even all that aware, I I barely even remember it happening. remember talking about it probably in current events in in grade school, but that's about it. So I just don't think we have the same stigma attached to it that that previous generations have had. Um, So there's that. Then there's also the material conditions that are continuing to kind of stagnate for the the middle and... and, uh, working classes uh, that, you know, with the fight for minimum wage increase that hasn't happened in, I think it's been 20 years now since they've, they've raised it up. Um, people are, are feeling a real and, and direct impact of their wages not going anywhere and their ability to even do things like pay rent and, and keep food in their, their refrigerator is, is shrinking year by year as uh, there's, there's not, better and better jobs being created and the the bottom is just not being lifted up so there's that factor that that's working in our favor and then there's also things like like occupy and then uh bernie sanders's candidacy as well as people like aoc and and others coming to the fore uh good role models of and, and i wouldn't call them necessarily leftists i i mean they're definitely not uh out and out socialist or, or communist or anything, but they're at least talking about uh, democratic socialist ideas. So mm-hmm. um, things like the Scandinavian model, just providing a, a, a uh, robust safety net for people, um, mm-hmm. favoring things like unions, stuff like that, stuff that hasn't been talked about in generations, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, basically since the the Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher era, uh, Neoliberalism has been the the I don't know, the um, the rallying point of the day. It's it's the thing that uh, both sides, if you will, of of the U.S. political parties have been able to agree on that you know we should do away with things like uh, social safety nets. You know, Bill Clinton got rid of uh, outright welfare and in favor of the welfare to work system. And just been a, a long and slow erosion of social safety programs and um, well at the same time continually bailing out uh, businesses that get in trouble you know mm-hmm. of, of course like again the the Wall Street bailout that happened around 2008 um, and it's I think it's all of those uh, programs coming back to, to bite everyone. Uh, who who's been espousing them for all these generations? Like, you, you, there's only so long that you can uh, erode the power and and the even the money of the people that you depend on to buy your products as a, as a business owner before it's going to end up hurting you too. Um, well, and I think you I think you see that coming, you know, the proof in the pudding really coming home with the COVID pandemic and, you know, most of the jobs that were created between 2009 and, and 2020, most of those jobs were service related jobs. Those were the jobs that have actually been eliminated or killed off in large measure by COVID because Mm -hmm. of, you know, what needs to be done to control the spread of the virus. But, The reality is that those were, you know, a lot of those were low paying, low wage jobs. And you really, it was difficult, even in the best of times to support a family on it, let alone, you know, have kids or to get ahead. And that was not always the case. And, you know, clearly we've, we've gotten to a point where we've lost a lot of those jobs now. And it's like, where do we go from here? So, um, so you mentioned, you know, one of, one of the things that really sticks me is the fact of like, when you drill down to it, like neoliberalism and capitalism, Mm -hmm. like what, what is the ultimate thing that they're trying to protect? Like, what is 
what's at the core of the value system. And to me, the, the core of the value system is accumulation of wealth without regard to anything else. Absolutely. And that's, when you look at um, socialist or communist or anarchist philosophy, what's at the core of that value system? What would you say? I would say it's, uh, first and foremost, providing for everyone's basic needs. So things like housing, food, water, um, heat, uh, but also things like transportation, access to education, uh, access to community and, and communication, I think is a big one, especially in our digital age. Um, I think those can be argued as basic necessities for life at this point. Uh, so there, there's that. There's, there's putting it down a floor uh, under which no one can fall. Mm -hmm. um, and then beyond that, spreading out power as, as far and, and as between as, as many hands as possible, at, le at least in my opinion, that, that is what uh, leftism broadly is all about. So uh, democracy, people, people love concepts like democracy and freedom and, and uh, self-determination, all these sorts of things. And yet, under our current system, uh, you spend a, an entire third of your adult life until the age of retirement at your workplace, you, you know, eight hours a day. Um, how much freedom, how much democracy, how much self-direction do you actually have unless you're an owner? Probably not very much. Uh, so why is democracy and, and freedom okay when it comes to political issues and exercising our power at the ballot box, but when it comes to what we spend most of our life, most of our waking hours doing, uh, somehow that's not okay. And we, we instead go in, in favor of a very authoritarian top-down system where we have things like at-will employment. Um, you don't have much power or ability to negotiate your wages or your working conditions, the, the safety measures that, that might be in place if it's a dangerous job. Um, you don't have the ability to much ability to negotiate your benefits uh, or even the hours that you work. You know, it's 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 all dictated to you by whoever the owner is and whoever they appoint to do their will as, as a manager. Well, even even from a standpoint of just, I mean, political uh, freedom or political mm -hmm. power, I mean, that's been um subverted by citizens united and really the corporate um overtaking of institutions that you know should have some representation in terms of individuals but it's becoming increasingly difficult as you know you have uh, money rolling mm -hmm. into campaigns to really control control agendas whether it's agendas around you know, dealing with climate change or dealing with, you know, human rights issues or, you know, personal safety, whatever, what have you. Yeah. And, um, you know, so you have neither, I would say, political freedom or economic freedom. The, the underlying fact, though, I, the underlying thing of value, though, I think that really stands out and I think is, is really not come up is the value of human life mm -hmm. you know to the left and i would say that the left to, to me a leftist philosophy means that every human life is valuable mm -hmm. which as radical as that sounds is also inherently spiritual and i would dare say you know christian mm -hmm. you know that every person has purpose and has value and you know, we're kind of going through this existence, you know, what is our, why are we here? What's our goal? And if our goal is to get the, get the uh, best quality of existence for each person, you know, how does that, how does that fit into a world where, you, again, you have that top-down control mm -hmm that has one goal, which is basically subjugating everybody for the purpose of more dollars. Mm -hmm. 
It yeah. doesn't. No, no, definitely not. You know, um, whether it's uh, Citizens United sorts of things where where more dollars equals more votes more often than not, uh, whether it's it's boycotts where it's vote with your dollars, um, all these sorts of schemes mean that the more dollars you have, the more more votes you have. <laughs> so if you don't have much, you don't have much freedom. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that that it, it is all about uh, bodily autonomy and uh, personal freedom to uh, live your highest and best life, whatever that may be. Maybe maybe you work so hard that you don't even have time to stop and think about, well, what would I do if I had you know my basic necessities met? Um, would I would I become a, an artist and, and contribute to the world in a way that that I otherwise may never and we, we the world may be impoverished for never having had uh, right. would I be a teacher would I spend more time with my kids raising my kids uh, to be the best people that they can be to, to uh-huh. usher in the, the next generation and and try and make it better than the one that's currently in charge yeah, um, and this this really gets to the issue of universal basic income that's been absolutely brought up with uh, Andrew Yang, who um, you know I supported during the uh, primaries, and I actually uh, interviewed him before he actually started running. And uh-huh. um, but I think this whole idea of universal basic income is really something whose whose time has come, in a way that um, it's much more feasible i guess given kind of changes in monetary theory with mmt and so forth so absolutely so i I think it definitely is something that you know it just keeps coming back as as an issue that that they're toying with and it it seems like COVID especially has uh laid bare the the need for just being able to to keep people at a basic level if tragedies like this happen you know like Uh I'm sure we're all going to ble- breathe a, a very heavy sigh of relief once uh, we're all pretty much vaccinated and, and we're beyond this, this COVID business. But there's nothing to say that, that there's not another bug coming around the corner or, or some other climate catastrophe. You know, um, if the if the uh, jet stream gets shut off by all this, this polar melt or whatever, and we're, we're dealing with more Arctic blasts every every winter and, and places like Texas, places that are not prepared to deal with that kind of cold are getting hit year after year. Um, so, yeah, UBI is, of course, not going to solve all of those problems, but it's definitely going to smooth it over a lot. Um, it would have allowed people to stay home. People wouldn't have been worried about losing their homes or their businesses uh, or their source of income if they had that, that little bit of cushion. And the countries that provided it more are countries that came out of COVID a lot faster, places like New mm-hmm. Zealand and, and South Korea. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's definitely an idea whose time has come. And it sounds like in the, the few places I, I just heard they had tried it out in Stockton, California, and they found that people were more likely to get jobs uh, when they had that extra cushion. They weren't worrying about constantly scrambling to get bills done and, and you know, provide child care or whatever it was. It got the- well. That's that's the thing. It takes money in order to earn money, right. and so the fact that there's, there's, I mean, even a fifteen dollar minimum wage still keeps you in poverty. You know, right. it's still poverty below the poverty right. level, and so you know the fact is that you know you, if you have kids, you need to provide childcare. You need to have transportation. You need to be able to get the clothes for what you're doing. You need to pay your rent and. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's even before doing the actual job and then trying to get compensated. So, you know, it just, you know, and and the toll that it takes in terms of the humanity of people, I think is just, that's the real price that we're paying. And you see it in terms of depression, uh, suicide rates, you know, right. substance abuse, in terms of people's quality of life, that really should not have to be the case. And that's what's truly soul crushing, I think. Right. Yeah. Poverty is a, a compounding problem. It, it costs yeah. a lot of money to remain poor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, um, now you mentioned uh, Kropotkin and uh, anarchism. You mm-hmm. know, when people hear the word anarchists, they think, you know, bomb-throwing maniacs. Right. But, 
In fact, that's not the case. And can you share a little bit about anarchism and why people are wrong to think that? Sure. Um, I, I think people do think that much in the same way that, or much for the same reasons that people have a bad opinion of communism. It's It's been uh, a term that's been maligned and manipulated by the powers that be uh, over the decades and centuries. What anarchism means more than anything is is the freedom to uh, live your life as you choose, as long as long as you're not hurting other people and preventing other people from doing the same. Uh, it, it means the the freedom uh, to decide what you want for your life and um, to not have some uh, again top down authoritarian tell you that. Uh, no, you have to instead go and, and work for a job that you hate or um, do things that, that you disagree with. Uh, it's, it's about, uh, more than anything, I would say, spreading of power. Uh, it's, it seems that in the long arc of history, we've gone from starting out with, with basically a horizontal system when we all lived in tribes and, and bands, where you might have a chief, you might have a medicine doctor or what a, a spiritual shaman, whatever, uh, whatever term would be used. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of hierarchy. You might have had a, a, a top soldier in your, your little group or, or whatever, but more or less people have the same political and, and everyday autonomy. Uh, and then at some point, people that learn that they could hoard resources uh, and the not only did that give them power over their neighbors, where they could wait out famine, they could sustain longer campaigns of, of warfare, but it also allowed them to control the people around them. And eventually that led to things like um, feudalism, basically, where you have the divine right of kings and you have all this apparatus set up to uh, entrench power at the top. and. Uh, that lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years until finally capitalism came along and said, uh, we don't really believe in the divine right of kings. We don't think there's anything inherent about what this person does that says that they get to, should get to make all the decisions. And, you know, over the course of uh, decades and hundreds of years, um, they emerged as the dominant force. And it wasn't exactly a linear thing. It never is. They were crushed time and time again by whatever feudal lord didn't like what they were doing. Uh, but eventually they, they wrested some of that power away from monarchs uh, and even uh, from the clergy in, into their own hands as uh, entrepreneurs and, and business owners. And so what I and, and other leftists see is that this is just a continuation of that long arc of history of, of wresting power from the few in, into the hands of the many and then spreading it out. And every time we see that happening, whatever human rights movement it is or, or political structure or struggle that is or uh, union organizing, every time you spread power out, there's a positive result. There's more good for more people. So in my mind, that, that's what anarchy does eventually. And it's going to be a long process. I don't, I don't make any, uh, I don't have any illusions that it's something that, that's just going to, uh, you know, come about fully formed tomorrow. But it, to have an anarchist mindset to me is to work for as best you can with whatever means you have, organizing power and trying to draw it away from its power centers, uh, wherever they be right now, and spread it amongst as many people, because then you're going to end up having the, the most good for the most people. And that's basically it. So what are some examples of like a, a truly anarchist or socialist society where this kind of overturning of neoliberal power are there any examples at all? Yeah, oh, that's very difficult. Functioning. Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing about it is it, they tend to, to start up really fast. Like uh, during the Spanish Revolution, there was uh, a group of anarchists. I don't, I don't recall what region it was offhand, but they managed to create an, a pretty uh, egalitarian, um, horizontally organized society for... A few years, but then they ended up getting crushed by the fascists. Um, 
and this this tends to happen again and again and and like i said just as as it probably happened or it did happen with uh capitalist uprisings i'm sure they were crushed time and time again before finally they gained a foothold um but if you look at the at the, the current day the, the two examples that, that come to my mind are one uh the zapatista movement in mexico they basically have carved a not small portion of mexico out as a uh, for lack of a better word, an autonomous zone where the Mexican government doesn't have a lot of say, they don't try to interfere, they just kind of let them do what they want. And they have a very horizontal structure. I don't know, I mean, it it all depends on your definitions, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they have a very horizontal structure in the way that they, um, uh, in the way they structure political power. They'll have, you know, small meetings in in uh, a village and then they will decide on something all together as a village they'll send a representative to a larger meeting and to a larger meeting and it, it's kind of um, oh is that is that still the case there yeah they, they still have control that's interesting that yeah it's, that's interesting because during the uh 1800s 1900s that area and the zapatista movement were actually really linchpins in terms of opposing centralization of government and they so i have to think that that long a period of time really instilled a, an educational and a sociological background mm-hmm. which makes it more likely for that to take root and to succeed i mean the challenge is when you're in quote unquote normal society you know you go through an educational system that's right. been you've been conditioned to be a cog right. you know what i mean yep and to accept what's going on and to hear the code words that they throw around for things to to trigger you and to draw a response but you don't have that same that same uh, environment um conditioning young minds and that they're actually open to this different outlook of priorities. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So they definitely made the space and uh, they've, it's really interesting the way they did it. I don't know a great deal about it, but uh, apparently they um, kind of, they, they broke away from the, the Mexican government. They de- declared themselves as, as in oper- in opposition to the Mexican government uh, but then they took a long time to integrate themselves with the uh, the native peoples in the, the areas of, of Chiapas that they uh, settled in to kind of integrate their system of, of thinking and, and their, you know, languages and life ways and all that sort of thing and kind of make the synthesis between, uh, they, they call themselves national, or they call themselves, um, excuse me, uh, libertarian socialists. So they integrated those those kind of European ideas in with the the indigenous ideas and they, they've kind of it seems like it's working for them they've been uh around since the 90s and, and they're still as far as i know they haven't lost any land they haven't uh, had suffered any huge defeats so uh yeah that that's one good example and then there's also in a, in a region of syria there is a another group um and they they go by a bunch of different names but basically uh the, the 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 blanket term for them is the the area of Rojava, uh, and in in similar fashion, uh, their leader, who at one time was a warlord and uh, did terrible things, uh, got sent to prison, and learned about uh, the work of Murray Bookchin, who was a uh, I think he was one of the the founders of the the philosophy of kind of green anarchism. Uh, or green anarchy, uh, so the idea of folding in um, ecological ideas in with uh, anarchist thinking, uh, spreading power not only to all people but to all living things, viewing them all as as part of a one larger community of, yeah. of living things, each with you know uh, rights and autonomy and all that sort of thing, and he influenced his his people to create. Uh, basically a new society based on, on those sorts of prim- principles. Um, and they continue to, to 
hang in there. I mean, despite pretty bad odds. I mean, they're in Syria, one of the most war-torn parts of, of the earth at this time. Um, but they've been instrumental in things like uh, fighting back against ISIS. Um, the U.S. had kind of a, a I, wouldn't, I don't know if it was a formal partnership, but they, they were working together to some degree at, at a point to uh, fight back against ISIS in, or whatever the, the term for the um, ISIS is in Syria. Um, and, and they too have a very horizontally organized structure where they, they try to elevate the, the voices of marginalized people, uh, women and, and other minorities that may not have had as much of a voice in the past and together try to share power. But at the same time, they're, they're very uh, militant uh, against people that would try and come in and uh, overtake them, so to speak. So yeah. what, what would you say is... We're getting towards the end of our, our time, sure. and, you know, clearly we have, you know, 20 more shows to do together, <laughs> which is great. Glad to hear. Which is great. And, but what would you say is a first step for people to, um, to execute in order to move from like neoliberal thinking to leftist thinking like what what can people do to actually start to effect a change in priorities and in behavior sure um i think the, like the, nothing nothing like super complicated but sure. like what can people do in their lives i think the, the first and most important thing to do is to kind of evaluate what you value in your own life? Do you value freedom? Do you value democracy? Do you think that people are more or less born uh, equal um, and so deserve an equal shot at, at having as, as good of a life as they can? And if the answers to all those are yes, then I would say the next step is to start seeking out uh, either literature, uh, especially if you're not in an area that's that's that has big population centers, uh, but seek out literature and also people um, that already have been thinking about these sorts of ideas. It doesn't matter what, what type of, of leftism you start with, you're probably going to end up being, uh, uh, you're not going to start out and end up in, in the same um, school of thought, probably. It's going to take a while to kind of get your groove and, and figure out what makes most sense to you and just, you know, kind of just be open to the ideas that capitalism is not the end of history. There's something that we could do together to get past it that, that provides for the needs of everybody. We already produce enough food, enough shelter, enough of all of life's necessities for every person. Uh, it's just a matter of getting it to the people that need it. Um, so yeah, so, so seek out organizations. Um, if you, if you have a Facebook account, you could come to the one of the two groups that I manage, one of those being Left Pod Posting, uh, where we talk about all sorts of leftist uh, podcasts. Um, and, and there's actually a bunch of leftist podcast creators that hang out there and, and post about their stuff and talk about it. Um, and then the other group I have is uh, Left Signal Boost. And those are both groups on Facebook. Uh, just go ahead and join them. And just kind of start asking questions. You know, we're very open. It's, I, I try to cultivate a very open and welcoming community in both of those spaces. Um, if you have any, if you want any suggestions for books or podcasts, whatever your, your media is, or if you want to know about organizations to join, if you're ready to take that step, there's going to be people there that we'd be more than happy to help with, with pointing you in the right direction at least. Yeah, I like the idea they, of identifying what you're, what's important to you. By the same token, as you identify what's important to you, I think also identify what's holding back hmm. that value manifesting itself, and how do you, you know, what what role does that play in your life? But um, 
No, I think that's uh, that's an excellent starting point because we really have to kind of internalize our own our own sense of self worth, but also the the value of human life mm -hmm. and other human life. Um, you mentioned leftism. I mean, by the same token, you can to me you can interchange the term humanism. You sure. know, we're talking about um, you know just the the value of the human species and you know not being subjugated by a few but right. for the benefit of all right. um if people want to uh other than uh on uh, your facebook groups how can people reach out to you if they uh they want to chat more with you sure uh well the the best the absolute best way to to chat with me is to join my live streams on twitch if you're not familiar with the twitch pa platform it's basically like youtube but live so if you go to uh, twitch.com and search for bread underscore theory, you can find my channel. I, I stream every Friday at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And the cool thing about uh, the live experience is there's a chat that's running throughout the entire broadcast. So you can just pose your question and then I'll be right there to answer it for you. I go over, uh, I go through the audiobooks of, of leftist thinkers. So right now we're working on uh, the Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin, one of the, the founders yeah. of Anarchist Theory. And I just do a chapter a week, and I'll, I'll pause and kind of give my own opinion about it and, and maybe try and help apply it to some of the philosophies that I care about and think about and, and help people apply it to modern-day life. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and beyond that, uh, if you want to follow me at any other platform, I, I, I have a podcast, I, I have a YouTube channel, I have a whole bunch of projects that are going on and if you want links to those uh facebook groups the best way to get all of those links is to go to my linktree account and that's at uh linktree that's l-i-n-k-t-r dot e e slash capital b uh in bread underscore capital t in theory so link tree slash bread theory gotcha awesome well zach uh you know i we got like a bunch of rabbit holes to go down in, <laughs> in the future. But um, what I'd like to do is maybe uh, come back in about a month or so and um, explore some more. So I appreciate your taking the time to uh, chat and we'll uh, we'll talk again. I would love that. And hopefully by then I've, I've figured out this whole Zoom thing better and we can actually have video to go along with the audio. <laughs> nope. No problem. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks talk a lot. Soon. Thanks so much.